Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This year on March 17th, 2024, it's the fifth Sunday in Lent, also St. Patrick's Day in some liturgical settings. And the first reading is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, Psalm 51, 1 through 12, Hebrews 5, 5 through 10, and from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Nothing very St. Patrick'sy about any of those, I suppose. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm not thinking hard enough, but certainly, you know, we've had all these gospel texts throughout Lent that I think direct us to maybe not the meaning of Jesus' death, but certainly the purposefulness of it and the uh, the fact that, that the gospel stories are pointing in that direction, not as an unhappy ending, but as something that Jesus foresees and invests with all kind of meaning. Is that fair or maybe a minimalist way of talking about it? Well, that's certainly true for, and the, I, I think the the gospel text from John certainly confirms that, right? That there's, and that's sort of how, of course, John perceives or portrays Jesus is really that determination of Jesus to knowing where he's going and and what the result of all of this is going to be. And so you have that language of, you know, Father, save me from this hour. No, this is the reason I have come for this hour. But I think also it's for John, and I think it's also helpful for us to think about as well, as we move to uh, move into Holy Week next week with Palm Sunday and the crucifixion, is uh, in verse 32, when you get an eye, when I am lifted up from the earth, that's the third time that Jesus has uh, said that over the um, course of John's gospel. And of course, we had that reading uh, th- um, from 314 and then in 828. And that lifted up is, yes, the cross, but it's also the resurrection and particularly for John, the ascension as well. And so I think I find that to be an important theological entry into the crucifixion of how is it that we hold Jesus' death together also with his life and the promise of the resurrection and the ascension. It's sometimes we become kind of linear in those realities and, um, and expectations. And, but yet the complexity theologically of holding all four of those realities together, uh, that we really do also see, um, on, in Jesus on the cross. So I, that's, as you said that, Matt, I was just thinking of, 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 yes, we're coming to this point, but we're, we also look back and look forward, and that's part of what a part of what the perspective of the cross is, I think. Well, and I think about looking backward and forward. Uh, Caroline, you taught me to read John this way, and uh, uh, we often talk about um, how we pay attention to um, who the who is among the crowd that is with Jesus and who is among the crowd that is against Jesus. I'm particularly struck here, and. I don't know that I paid attention to this ever before, Um, in that among those who came to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they spoke to Philip, Philip spoke to Andrew. And then Jesus answers saying that the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I often read that and go straight to the voice coming and saying, I am glorified and I have been. But this uh, little parable that Jesus makes means a whole lot more to me now. And that's where he says, um, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And I think about this whole idea of the fact that Jesus, this is where you come in, Caroline, for God so loved the world, demonstrated in Jesus. And so this fruit that is being born of the salvation we think of in Jesus being lifted up is a fruit that is not merely for the Jews. And maybe I should say it for us today. It's not merely for those of us who are already Christian, but it is indeed for all the world. I, I, that, 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 was a, that was a good read for me this year. 
Well, and, and yeah, Joy, and also that reference to the Greeks is definitely um, a, a, a really going back to 1219, which is, of course, the verse right before that, but where the Pharisees say, see, see the whole world is coming after him. Mm-hmm. And and so you, and you will get the world, of course, at the arrest with the reference to the mm-hmm. To the Roman soldiers, as well as the, uh, as well as the police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and and in conjunction with that, you have uh, really a, a an allusion with Andrew and then Andrew and Philip, an allusion back to the calling of the disciples mm-hmm. here, and so it really is uh, as as you were talking, Joy. I was thinking it's really another moment for. Uh, the world to see, right? To recognize who Jesus is. It's a, it's their own sort of call story or our own sort of reminder of, of what it means to follow Jesus. And so it's, it there, it's not accidental that there's that reference back to Andrew and Philip, that here's, Mm -hmm. here's a moment for the world to, uh, to uh, recognize, uh, to recognize in Jesus of God, being visible, um, the presence of God and Jesus. And so it is that, it is that, uh, that significant moment of recognition or revelation mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. Uh, dare we say decision going back to John, you mm-hmm. know, John three nineteen through 21. Sure. Wow. I, I, uh, this is all great. The angle I would want to insert here is the the irony the humor the almost the satire of the idea of being lifted up on a cross being something that's going to draw people in it's going Mm. to be attractive Mm. and Mm -hmm. this is uh, you know and he's not he has not said anything about cross in this passage but about you know the narrators you know giving us little wink he said this to indicate the kind of death he was going to die Mm mm-hmm and that what is meant to be utter humiliation, like literally a visible elevated death to further degrade and to humiliate a victim becomes for Jesus yeah. and for the early Christians, this kind of ironic statement against that, which is again, something that isn't unfamiliar in to, to powerless people and powerless ways of dying to turn somebody's oppression against the oppressor in some way or to take pride or even power in one's suffering, but just to point out how bizarre this sounds in that ancient context, especially as early Christians are trying to make the case that actually the crucifixion was an enthronement, actually the crucifixion was a glorification, actually the crucifixion was the uh, a high point, no pun intended, you know, of his of his ministry and what it's meant to be about which just shows a lot of theological work going on in somebody's <laughs> head, right? But right. also a way of saying this is not just a quote-unquote sacrifice. This is not uh, a mistake or getting on Pilate's bad side on the wrong day. There's something in here that's about an overturning of perception and an overturning of where and how power is to be found uh, in the world and what makes somebody quote-unquote attractive mm-hmm. as a religious leader, mm-hmm. what kind of message he's, uh, he's known for. Mm-hmm. Well, you really, yeah, you really see that too, what you're talking about, Matt, in verse 31, right? Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's that sense of of how Jesus' death will be this defeat of the power of evil um, and, and the power of death and the way in which, and the way at which powers, the powers that be use death to their own advantage, Mm -hmm. use death to threaten and use death to show power and authority. And yet Jesus' death is going to turn that around to um, glory and solidarity and, and justice and righteousness. And, uh, and so that, that, that reference there too is really important that we're we're meant to see this this lifting up right in a in a very different um in a very different way very different perspective and reading it through um that lifting up goes back to that conversation with Nicodemus which goes back to uh the um uh, uh Israelites recorded in numbers 
um, when um, they were poisoned by the snake and yet it was looking up at the snake. Uh, there's, there's also work there in terms of how that interpretation takes on new meaning, that uh, the very thing that should be uh, death, or in this case, and humiliation, becomes the source of life in the hand of a God who can turn darkness into light and uh, chaos into a beautiful creation. One last thing I'd say as well is the, the you might want to anticipate Easter a little bit in this and the that, that parable, right? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That the cross is also a story about the destruction of Jesus's body, which makes the embodiedness of the resurrection all the more important, I think. It's a transformed body, but it's not mm -hmm. as if the body's only role is to die and to suffer humiliation or to be totally wiped out. And this is where the seed metaphor, the grain metaphor might fall short, right? It's not that the grain has to be utterly obliterated, but it transforms right. into something it's new. And that, so that so that we're not, to me, that's just incredibly important for thinking about Easter, but also I think for Good Friday in terms of what's, what's going on with his body here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not being made waste in the way in which his his um, oppressors intended to be. Which I think is really, um, I'm glad you mentioned that, Matt, because I think that's really important also for John's, John's central theology or Christology of the word became flesh. And so mm -hmm. at this point, we have to, we do need to think about what is happening to this body of God that is, that has taken on flesh and now mm -hmm. will die and will be buried. And, uh, and so we are, uh, we I, in a nice way, I'd say we are invited, invited, but we're really forced to think about uh, think about what's going to happen to God's body uh, in Jesus in the, in very different ways in the Gospel of John because of that that you know very direct claim that the Word became flesh. And I talk about this when I talk about this passage, or when I talk about John one fourteen, I uh, I. I will often point out that it's not the word became anthropos or man, but the man. word became flesh. Yeah. And so we are meant to then think back on, I think, uh, I think, think back on the fact of how is it that God has revealed God's self in the flesh um, throughout, throughout Jesus' ministry and the way in which that, at least for John, particularly, but for the, all the gospels, this is a, it's a, the fleshly, is that a, yeah, I think that's a word, fleshly experience of God matters. And so that, and that perspective matters and that truth and that promise matters. And so there's something really quite uh, also mm, poignant and um, pastoral about thinking about God's body and then our own bodies and the own uh, our own realities of bodies and death. So, yeah, that's really important. And I don't want to take too much time here, but this is one of the places where understanding the ancient context to which there would be the original audience uh, for this uh, that was a big philosophical question of whether or not flesh, body, embodiment uh, could have any goodness, could have any benefit. And uh, so um, um, when we say that, even now, sometimes our language um, as Christians, when we talk about what salvation looks like or, or what the gift of God is, it sounds like it doesn't affect our embodied life, our everyday present, you know, dirty hands, fishy smelling, you know, windblown hair, Jesus kind of life. <laughs> Well, we should move to Jeremiah 31. If you're new to the lectionary and think, wow, we sure do Jeremiah 31 a lot, you're right. <laughs> Shows up quite a bit. Um, and to that, I would say, have you read the rest of Jeremiah? So <laughs> this is the happy part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. 
So we've and, seen some texts about covenantalism throughout Lent and uh, a text like this as well, I think, is this idea of some of the newness that Jesus talks about in John 12. I really appreciate Beth Tanner pointing out the 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 effort we have to make to avoid supersessionism here, especially mm -hmm. I think at this time of year. Mm -hmm. And remember the old covenant promised forgiveness as well. God forgave iniquity, uh, and I would say still does through um, through other means as well. It's not like forgiveness is this new Christian intervention or a forgiving God is a, a brand new Christian idea. So just I, to point that out. I appreciate that, uh, Matt, because... Um, this text uh, has some echoes of Jesus' encounter recorded in uh, the Gospel according to John uh, in chapter 4 with the woman at the well. And uh, this, this kind of sense of, of what, what Jesus will do. And um, um, if I got my zip code right, that language uh, is, is, I think, in chapter 4, uh, or maybe it's in chapter 3, where it sounds as if this forgiveness is a Jesus idea, and it's actually a God idea, and we, we find it here in Jeremiah. So I greatly appreciate that, um, but also uh, this recognition of what it means that this new covenant, a covenant that was uh, a different covenant that was given um, uh, to ancient Israel, uh, just as the Israelites who were delivered from slavery were given a different covenant than their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, each of the covenants that has been given to the people of God has not um, uh, removed the past people, but it has borne fruit to extend. Um, and, and so uh, I think it's real important for us not to forget uh, that this is what God has always been about. And um, it won't be a matter of defining someone that is out, but it will be a matter of having the graciousness of God, the capacity, the patience of God, the capacity to forgive like God, so that we can be um, those who uh, whose lives invite others to want to be a part of the covenant, as opposed to using uh, our position to suggest that we've got some one-upmanship on them. Yeah, that's helpful for me too, Joy, in that I, uh, I, I think it's hard to connect this text to John. Um, I mean, the, the reading, the John 12 reading. 12 reading, right. Yeah, so part of me wants to, uh, part of me wants to just take it on its own. But and and maybe invite people homiletically invite people into uh, into the imagination of covenant and what does it what how how is it that we are carrying on that covenantal relationship uh, that 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 there's a continuity right of God's commitment to covenants that we are now a part of as well and what what. Uh, what is it that we are embodying or what is it that we are uh, committing to in that covenant at this moment? Uh, I'm having this relationship with God at this time. And so how maybe we imagine, uh, you know, Palm Sunday and, and then Holy Week and even into Easter, what does that then mean for your relationship with God and the covenant mm. you want? keep with God and what kinds, what, how do you imagine God at this point in time, liturgically and in the promises of Holy Week and Easter, what does that reveal about God's covenant, mm -hmm. covenantal characteristics? So I, that's where I would think, I, I think I would go homiletically is, is help people imagine that aspect of God, but then how is it that we it's not that and it's not only that it's not just that we've been bequeathed with it, right? That God has made a covenant with us, but what does that what difference does that make for how we will how we will respond and how we will how we will proclaim the promises of the resurrection uh and the promises of of Jesus' death and resurrection? What does that uh how does it shape us as covenantal people? 
Psalm 51, 51 also, <laughs> also back from Ash Wednesday. Another familiar, yes. Well, that I think that's actually a helpful first direction, isn't it? Uh, to say, how does this, how does a psalm sound different? Uh, when we read it now? That, you know, that we heard it on Ash Wednesday and now given what we've, the, this process of going through Lent, um, how, are there aspects of this psalm that we hear differently because of where we are now compared to February 14? Um, and so that would be one, maybe one direction I would go is there, and particularly if a preacher looks back on what they have preached over the last, you know, five weeks, uh, are there certain themes that now can be um, connected to Psalm 51 in some particular ways that help, uh, to, that help their listeners reflect on where they've been in this, you know, to use the word journey, but where they've been in the last five weeks, uh, this particular wilderness <laughs> experience, these 40 days, and and how does this, yeah, how does this psalm get embodied different, differently or felt differently, I think, or heard differently because of that. So I think that bracketing is important. Mm -hmm. Helpful, yeah. And, and again, uh, this idea, as you were just talking about in terms of this covenant, people uh, and this idea that Jeremiah brings up of us worshiping God in our heart, uh, that seems to be this prayer, if you read it side by side. You know, you know give me a clean heart. Uh, I desire truth in my very being. Uh, so teach me uh, your wisdom in this secret heart. Each, each of these, um, in some ways, can be read against uh, this covenant that is not taught externally, but is uh, embodied, uh, lived uh, uh, from the depths of our character. Yeah, and some ways what you're saying, Joy, helps me answer what Caroline was posing as a question <laughs> in terms of how does this sound differently? Because that sounded good, and I kept thinking, what's my answer to that? And I think you've got the way in, at least for me, Joy, about the way the psalm reveals a sense of one's own heart and one's own contrition, which to be fair, I don't always feel. So how does a psalm then give you language that then helps move you toward that contrition yourself, even if you don't feel it? Not like in a fake it, like till you make it thing, but in, in the <laughs> sense of how does, how do these psalms work as prayers? This is, I mean, the more I sit with this psalm, there's more aspects of it that I really don't like or that really bug me. And then I have to kind of call myself back to, but what's the psalm about? And mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's not a great reflection of the nature of sin and forgiveness. At least it can't sit by itself. And what can, right? I mean, sin and mm -hmm. forgiveness, we're talking such complex things in terms of the damage that sin can do. But where the psalm really shines, I think, is as an example of what it looks like or sounds like to express trust mm -hmm. in God's commitment to restore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think there's yeah. the aspects, and I wish the psalm said better. There's aspects of forgiveness. I wish that there's imagery I wish wasn't there. But, you know, the creating me a clean heart, right? Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit to simply believe that God will do that and wants that is where I think this psalm is really uh, important and learning to feel that for oneself. Yeah. Especially when we have rebelled against God when we have done our worst, when we have uh, hurt someone traumatically, um, maybe irreparably, um, the consequences of our actions, um, uh, you know, they, they, it's not like spilt milk. You can't just wipe it up. They're, they're, you know, they, it, you're going to have a scar after this one. Um, and at, at some point, I don't know what to say but I'm going to trust God to do the transforming work. I think is, is, yeah, I appreciate that. That's huge. That's a huge way to read that. And I, I, song. yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I would call people or our listeners attention then to the last few sentences of the commentary on the website by, um, uh, by Elizabeth Webb that, 
that, uh, which is a rerun, but her last couple of lines are just beautiful. The God who is everlasting love will never abandon us, no matter what our guilt says. Steadfast love and abundant mercy not only heal us of the stain of sin, but also of the lie of our worthlessness. Who among us doesn't need to hear that word? Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really. And now for something utterly different. <laughs> Hebrews 5 and Melchizedek. Oh, yes. <laughs> You know, you could, you could it, just focus on verses seven through nine and cut out. You always <laughs> add verses, and you might just want to like mm. let Melchizedek have the day off, unless you really want to explain him. But what were you going to say, Joy? I was just going to say, as if Hebrews doesn't bring us enough, we <laughs> add Melchizedek, who is always confusing. <laughs> yeah, you're going to need at least five to eight minutes of your sermon just explaining who Melchizedek was and why you've <laughs> right. never heard him. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, I, I would call people atten uh, people's attention to the commentary on the website. Um, Elizabeth uh, Johnson does a wonderful job with this, as usual, <laughs> one of our great commentators, uh, <clears throat> and trying to get at you know some of the some of the unique themes of Hebrews and 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 it's one of those texts like. Well, uh, it, it how is it you just kind of treat it on its own and not <laughs> not try to. <laughs> Not a Not, I think you got to read. You got to read Genesis fourteen and Psalm one ten. You got to like exactly. all the way into Melchizedek. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> yeah, you got to go full blown Melchizedek or something. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and 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 for us, uh, this whole idea of priest um, too often is, um, you know, even in in uh, some of our our denominations that. Are we call our pastors priests? They look more like, um, you know, just a minister in the community than this idea of priest priesthood. Um, that I think, if we were to look at it, we could then begin to to teach. But that's a that's like you said. That's a at least eight minutes in the sermon and a lot more study on a different route that maybe we wouldn't cover uh, coming up to uh, Easter. Yeah. Yeah. So verses seven through nine, though, and that also sets up nicely toward Palm, uh, toward Palm Sunday and awesome. helping people, yeah. whatever else is happening in your congregation around Lent. But it also, mm -hmm. I think it goes, uh, for me, it goes back and here, I just, I'm contradicting what I just said, but, uh, <laughs> but. First it, time ever on this never, podcast. Never, never. <laughs> never, never, never. But, uh, but, but going back to, you know, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. And so it's a it's a reminder of, uh, again, of that who is on the cross is indeed um, the, the flesh of God and yes. uh, and and the entirety of the entirety of that existence on the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, not just not just the three years that are narrated, at least in John, one year, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not just his ministry, but his the entirety of his life and his experiences um, are, are, are brought to bear um, with loud cries and tears uh, in absolute trust to the one who is able to save him from death. And so um, there's something there's something I think really powerful in that that also could be preached on this last Sunday of Lent.